2006 to 2009. He also worked in several capacities at the bank, including head of special studies from 2005 to 2006, and also served as senior economist from 1996 to 2000. So that was the profile of the first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Max Opokwafari. And as you can see, he started off from the Bank of Ghana, went to the IMF, and he's back at the helm of affairs at the Bank of Ghana. So without further ado, I want to say a very big thank you to Doc for joining us, taking time out of your packed schedule to come and join us here. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Philip. It's good to see you again. Yes, yeah. indeed it is. Yeah. So um, before we get into the economy and all the numbers, in August of 2017, you were given this high office. Looking back uh, from that time to now, it's about an odd three years. When you look back from the time you signed your contract, going through the banking sector reforms in 2017, in 2018, everything in 2019, sometimes do you ask yourself that, mm, who sent me to come and do this work? Or within you, you are fulfilled and happy with what is going on and what you are doing? Uh, thank you very much, Philip. It's quite interesting. And uh, sometimes you ask yourself, why am I here? And why are you <laughs> here in such a time like this, right? Yeah. But I think that uh, if you look back from when we started in August or from the beginning of 2017, we have done quite a lot and uh, achieved quite a lot. Uh, we came in, I came to meet the governor who was already at post in uh, April yeah. 2017 and uh, came straight to firefighting. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and it has continued since then. Yeah. Uh, so we've tried to combine firefighting with strategic planning to try to also shape the uh, policies that we want to put in place. And it has been rewarding, fulfilling, but challenging. And I think that I wouldn't be, I would say it's not an understatement when I say that it has been challenging. I can imagine, because looking at your organogram on the Bank of Ghana website, you oversee seven departments. And within those seven departments are two critical areas, currency management, which is not an easy task, I can imagine, and the payment systems. Apart from that, you're also on the board of the Bank of Ghana, you're part of the MPC, and you're on other boards within the space. When you are done with the work day and you go home, what do you do typically to unwind? I, for example, will go and watch a movie, just sleep. What, what do you do? Because your job involves being on top of things, and I don't see room for you to rest. But what do you do apart from being the first deputy governor? Well, I thank you very much. As a deputy governor responsible for a broadly economic policy, in addition to the uh, payment system, currency management, risk management, that's a lot HR, oh. corporate <laughs> management system, that's quite a lot. Yeah. But I think that's why teamwork comes into play. What do I do to relax and distress? When I'm not working at the Bank of Ghana, I'm quite a bit active at church okay. as an officer of the Church of Pentecost. Oh, so wonderful. I try to be very active at church. But beside that, I used to play soccer, but I'm not able to play <laughs> soccer again. <laughs> And uh, whilst I was in the U.S., I started picking up golf okay, and okay. playing golf. And I stopped when I came in 2017. In the last couple of months, I've picked up playing golf again. So that's what I'm doing now, trying to sharpen up my skills and re reduce my handicap so that I, con I can continue to enjoy the game. They say, they say <laughs> golf is a big man's sport. So obviously, it will, it will go with the terrain. Some of us haven't reached that level yet. So. It's quite scientific, so it helps you to <laughs> simulate your brain. So anyway, it's quite anyway, anyway. But, 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 I mean, looking forward, um, in terms of uh, the bank and then your professional life, I mean, right now you are still with the bank, obviously, but let's, let's look far into the future, 5, 10 years, 15 years from now. If you're not doing central banking, what do you think you do? Will you go into ministry full-time? Will you do ministry part-time? Will you lecture? What do you think will be the future for Maxwell in the next 5, 10, 15 years, beyond Bank of Ghana? Uh, that's quite an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have actually tried to, if you look at, uh, I've started working since 1995, wow. when I finished graduate school. So I've been into different things and acquired a lot of experience beyond professional work. So I have so many other things that I've acquired along the lines. And I think that beyond Bank of Ghana, there may be so many other yeah, things so I can do 
in addition to continue to work in the church and also continue to play golf. It's good, it's good, it's good. <laughs> I like that we are, we are delving into his personal life a bit. It's, it's, it's good to see what they do and what they get up to apart from the numbers and the figures. Yeah. But, Doc, I want us to uh, move away from the personal issues a bit yeah. and then jump into the matters that give us, all, all of us, our daily bread. I'm here discussing with you. You also go and work advancing monetary policy. I'll start off with the economy, but before I come to you, I want our guests to be familiar with some of the data we put together, uh, our production team has put together. And we'll start off with the economy in sense of the fact that we have experienced a contraction. Now let me just break this down a bit. GDP is the total value of goods and services produced in the economy within a year. Now anytime you go out, you buy, you sell, somebody produces, that's our GDP moving up. When there's a standstill or there's a problem, that production, buying and selling, doesn't go on as much as we would like to. And in the second quarter of this year, we saw what happened with the COVID and the lockdown and everything. So you can see that the Ghana Statistical Service released some data, and we've seen that our economy has indeed contracted. So if there was a graph, you see as it is on your screen there, it's, dro it's dropped or dipped down. But there are some sectors that have accounted for this dip, and the hospitality and restaurants, was one of the sectors that contracted the most by over 70%. We saw others like the information and communication sector moving up or expanding because I'm sure most of us were buying data, getting involved with stuff. Now, what I'm going to ask from Doc is the most important thing here, we have the figures already. Now, in terms of our recovery, when the finance minister presented uh, a statement to parliament somewhere ending of March, he spoke about our recovery some are talking about a U-shape, some are saying V. I think he said tra trapezoid, if I'm not right. If I'm not wrong, I beg your pardon. What do you think will lead Ghana's economic recovery post this COVID? Is it going to be a Greek? Is it going to be industry? Is it going to be services? Where do you think the goat is going to come from? Well, thank you very much, Philip. I think that to be able to understand where the recovery will come from, we need to try to also understand where the contraction came Perfect. from. And uh, as you rightly said, the recent data released by the Ghana Statistical Service shows that the economy contracted by 3.2%. Uh, yeah. Contraction means that GDP growth was negative. So it wasn't a growth, it was a decline, a decline. in GDP by a negative 3.2%. Uh, and, and this really was not unexpected. Uh, it has been projected that yeah. GDP was going to contract by 5.4% in the second quarter, and it turned out to be less than what, what we was projected of 3.2%. Uh, but clearly, why in the second quarter? Because if you realize when the pandemic was declared in March, right in the third quarter of uh, third week of March, the president came out with the first set of restrictions, yeah. which included a lockdown. And that quickly led to a lot of uh, restrictions in movement, uh, social distancing, and yeah. other uh, containment measures yes. to try to address this serious public health crisis. And, and, and the full impact of that initial announcement of the restrictions, even though it was in March, did not happen in March. As you expect, the full impact moved into April, yeah. and April belongs to the second quarter. And that's where we began to see the full impact. And as you rightly said, we saw the full impact in the hospitality industry because all the borders were closed. closed. Tourism went almost to the zero line. We saw that restaurants were closed because there was social distancing and you could not go out to the restaurants. People were not able to go out. In fact, we were tracking Google data that shows movements of people and you could see significant drop in movements of people from their homes to some well, of these places. So we were not surprised by the contraction that we saw in the third quarter. But what we have seen beyond what you have seen in the third quarter is that at a central bank, one of the advantages we have is to have access to what we call high frequency leading indicators. Okay. And putting those high frequency leading indicators together, we've been able to put together what we call composite index of economic activity, activity. Okay. which helps us, that long word, all we're trying to say that helps us to track the short-term dynamics in economic activity and gives us a sense of where economic activity is heading to. So even though we saw a contraction in the second quarter, the data that we are picking from the composite index economic activity and high frequency data, including credit to private sector, uh, manufacturing sales, and a few other things, shows that 
we're beginning to see some significant recovery okay. already in the first few months of the third quarter, up to September, in fact, throughout the whole uh, third quarter. And this recovery is quite significant to the extent that we think that growth will be positive in the third quarter. So if you put it that way, then the leading indicators is pointing to what we will call a V-shaped recovery. Okay. Because the significant negative impact and the, we expected the lockdown and the restrictions to be prolonged over a period of time, but you saw that there was a gradual lifting of those restrictions. Uh, it meant that the impact on economic activity had not been as severe, even though it's a contraction. And zero, negative 3.2 is not a small contraction. Yeah, yeah. But to have a turnaround in the third quarter into a positive territory shows that the recovery is going to be more of a V-shape than a U or a trapezoid. Having said that, though, we are all hearing about uh, uh, the, second the second wave going to true. come through. And so all this is being discussed with the view that there is significant uncertainty around this V-shaped type of recovery. And the sectors from the leading indicators that we've seen to address your question to drive this recovery, we've seen a rebound again in the services sector. Okay. And then also seen a rebound in construction manufacturing okay. sector and agri. So these are the four key sectors that we've seen yeah. as the sectors that will be driving will the recovery going forward. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, a very important question that comes up is fiscal stimulus that's coming from governments, mainly Ministry of Finance and monetary stimulus coming from the Bank of Ghana. We've seen in developed markets where even till date, the US is still haggling over how much, who is going to pass what, but they've already passed a significant amount of stimulus, fiscal stimulus and the monetary stimulus. Now, the finance minister announced a number of packages and interventions for the broader market. BOG also announced things that would aid the government itself and then the banking sector. Do you think for where we are now, with the modest recovery we are seeing or moderate recovery we are seeing, do we need more fiscal and monetary stimulus or it's enough for now, given where we are as, a, as an economy? Because when, you look, when people always ask me, look how the U.S. is pushing our money. Why can't Ghana do the same thing? That's the main question. Can we do more? Do we have more muscle power for fiscal and monetary stimulus? Or where we are is where we are. I think that uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, there was a significant amount of uncertainty. This is new. Nobody has seen it before. And nobody knew how it was going to pan out. It was going to evolve. So we were, everybody was trying to understand what the impact was going to be, the uncertainty was so high, and so how to even respond. So at that time, I would say that almost every economy was looking at the doomsday scenario, where they were going to put everything out there to make sure that we make, in fact, countries were at the point where they needed to make a decision and a choice to calibrate a careful balance between saving lives and maintaining yeah. the structures for continuing supporting the living, which is to put it in simple terms, saving lives and, and stability, yeah. right? And the president has been very clear in terms of the fact that this is a public health crisis, and if it's a public health crisis, then he will make sure that whatever it takes to make sure that the like that. impact of the crisis is muted and minimized and mitigated is done. And so you will see that the Minister of Finance rep uh, presented to Parliament, to the people of Ghana, a set of measures yeah. that were to be introduced to contain the impact of the COVID, especially the public health effect, and also its impact on the economy and, and, and ability of the people in the country to make a living. And we can say with boldness that Ghana has received international acclaim in terms of how this impact of COVID has been handled okay. and its impact on the economy, as we've just discussed earlier on, in terms of how the expected negative impact of growth hasn't been as initially expected. Yes, you're talking about fiscal stimulus, so you can see that there has been a lot of fiscal uh, spending yeah. towards this. But on the monetary side, we were also able to make an assessment, to look at the, imp the room that we had the impact on our balance sheet and came to the point where we said that we have room to support this COVID response of up to 10 billion Ghana cities. That should tell you that we, both the fiscal and the central bank, were benefiting from the gains from reforms. 
because not every economy had the capacity to respond the yeah. way Ghana responded. And why did we have that room, a space, to be able to respond? It's because of the reforms that have been introduced, okay. both from the monetary side and also the significant fiscal consolidation, yeah. that created that space to allow us to be able to have the room to respond. And I think that at this point in time, this is the room that we can have to be able to respond. And it is important to see how the recovery, the V-shaped recovery, is going to pan out before we be able to make an assessment to see whether there is the need to continue to sustain that kind of recovery to sustain growth going forward. Sure. Okay. Fair enough, um, Doc. But I'm sure you're expecting my next question to focus on fiscal slippages. Over the course of, our, um, of this Fourth Republic, uh, I know I am still a baby, but, <laughs> but I have read data. And I think apart from the year 2004, every election year we've had significant fiscal excesses. Now, you've mentioned the fact that we've had consolidation. We've done brilliantly. You mentioned the fact that we've been internationally acclaimed. But this is an, an, an election year. And over the course of time, we've seen that any time there's a fiscal excess, there's an impact on the monetary side. That's your side. Given this year, given where you sit on the monetary space, what's your projection in terms of our consolidation efforts? Do you think we are going to slip back again or we have indeed consolidated and we're going to carry this into the next year? Uh, I mean, Philip, uh, you are right. I mean, since the beginning of the Fourth Republic, I think one can single out 2004 where we were able to have an election year that was consistent with also the fiscal consolidation part. But having said that, I think right from the beginning of when I've been part of this uh, uh, economic management process from 2017, we have worked together with the government to try to ensure that the reforms that have been introduced become institutionalized and embedded. And I think that I want to quote the Minister of Finance who likes using the word irreversibility of these reforms. And this is what we have tried to do using the Public Financial Management Act, yeah. looking at the central bank, central bank financing. Actually, up until 2016, the, li the, the limit on central bank financing was over 10%. Yeah. And this, in 2016, when the Bank of Ghana Act was amended, this was brought to 5% of previous year's tax revenue. But we did not end there. We went beyond that to talk about signing a memorandum of an understanding with the Ministry of Finance to limit it to 0%, of pre which means absolutely no, no central, central bank, bank financing finance. to the Ministry of Finance. This is a way to try to signal that we want to institutionalize these reforms and to minimize fiscal dominance and anchor uh, macroeconomic stability to support the government's growth and transformation agenda. This year, unfortunately, the discussion has shifted from electoral slippages to COVID Which, response. Yeah. So uh, we, will not be, we, we will now be talking about whether the COVID response has moved us away from the consolidation part. Clearly, it has moved away from the consolidation part. But I think that is expected, yeah. and rightly so. As I said, that there was a careful uh, choice between saving lives and maintaining stability, yeah. and we chose to try to introduce policies to be able to make sure that the public health crisis is contained. So clearly, the Ministry of Finance has gone to Parliament to suspend the fiscal rule to yeah. ensure that we'll be able to uh, spend over and above what had pl been planned for the year. Because the year had been planned to have 4.7% of GDP deficit, but that clearly was not able to support the spending for to respond to the COVID. So that has been suspended, meaning that the fiscal will be off the consolidation part. But policies are being put in place starting from 2021 to gradually return to the fiscal consolidation part and back to the 5% of GDP deficit for fiscal consolidation. I think that's a very fantastic point there. I want us to move into the second point of our discussion. And just before the screen behind me changed, it was the Bank of Ghana's uh, entrance. That's number one top road, uh, John Evans Atamio's High Street. For those of you who are familiar with uh, going to Accra to do your shopping and buying, I'm sure you've passed in front of Bank of Ghana a number of times. Now, since 2017 to date, we've discussed Bank of Ghana a lot because of the plethora of reforms they have implemented in the banking and non-bank financial space. 
Now, we are going to focus on four key issues here. Transparency, accountability, independence, and then the supervisory role of the Bank of Ghana. I'll start with independence. And I, I can see maybe Doc is smiling within him. Over, over time, there has been a certain perception that Bank of Ghana as an institution and not individuals. Let me be very, very clear here. The bank as an institution over time has been submissive or subservient. We've had civil society organizations write articles, opinion pieces about how governors should be more, I'm looking for the right word to use. They should stand up more to the Ministry of Finance. Now, I want to find out from Dr. Opoko Fari that, Doc, why is there a perception that over time, or as far as I am concerned, when you look at discussions that are going on, there's always this feeling of perception that the Bank of Ghana as an institution is not independent in itself as we see in other institutions. But in your law, you are granted your operational independence, your monetary policy independence and everything. But why is there still a perception that, for example, the Ministry of Finance controls the governor and says, you know what, governor, print money for me, do this for me, do that for me. We want this, we want that. Why is there that perception? It's quite interesting that there is that perception because that's really not what is on the ground, actually. Uh, the Bank of Ghana Act as amended in 2016, and it was the same in the Bank of Ghana Act that was introduced in 2002, Two, yeah. was the, uh, granted operational independence to the central bank. Clearly, operational independence doesn't mean that you operate in an island, no. right? Operational independence means that your tools of monetary policy, the conduct of policy, and other things, you are operationally independent in the sense that you are not detected to by any other authority or individual. And that's clearly stated in the Bank of Ghana Act. It also goes on to then clearly sign, uh, single out that the primary mandate of the central bank is price stability. And that should not be subordinated to any other objective of the central bank. And in the conduct of that policy, we should not uh, subject, you, you are not subjected to any authority or individual in the conduct of that. And you will see that in, in, in the conduct of our monetary policy operations, we have an independent body within the central bank called the Monetary Policy Committee, committee. chaired by the governor. The two deputies are members of the committee. We have the head of financial markets department as a member of the committee. We have the head of research as a member of the committee. And we have two independent uh, members appointed outside the bank and outside the public sector sitting on the committee as members of the committee. And Philip, it will be interesting maybe one day to show how discussions at the MPC go yeah. on and the fact that the minister and the members of the government all hear about the decisions of the MPC, the same as the press and the rest of the general public hear about it. So there's no way they can hear about it before? Before, no. It, that, it never, it's never happened. And I was part of the process of setting up the entire MPC process right from 2001 before I left and came back to be a member of the MPC. And there's no way any other... In fact, the Ministry of Finance is not represented on that committee. I've listed the members of that committee. committee. So the central bank has operational independence. But at the same time, the act and the constitution says that the governor of the central bank is an economic advisor to the government. Yeah. So then that's where you see that operationally we are independent. We are not subjected to any other person uh, dictating to you as to what to do. Clearly, nobody dictates to the central bank in terms of printing money. I'm in charge of currency management, yeah. and nobody has ever told me as to when to print money, and how <laughs> to print money, and what amount. We have a framework that determines the, uh, the currency in circulation and how much new money to print to ensure that we have enough resources, enough uh, currency to meet economic activity in the system, and also to ensure what technically we call degree of exchangeability. So then you have to do the calculus to tell that we need this total amount of 200 Ghana yeah, to this total amount of 100. And what all that means is that any amount of, any note that you issue out, you should be able to get change. It shouldn't be difficult for people to find change for you. And we do all those simulations to determine when and the frequency and how to print money. And there is no discussion whatsoever from any other quarters. In so terms everything of is watertight. Exactly. Okay. And so, but then, as I said, you can't operate as an you island. And so we work together. The governor of the central bank 
co-chairs the Economic Policy Coordinating Committee with the Minister of Finance, okay. where technically we meet to discuss policies and to ensure that there is policy consistency. One thing as an inflation cen uh, targeting central bank is the fact that we need to have what you call monetary policy fiscal coordination. Mm -hmm. And you can only have coordination when you engage. But having coordination and engaging does not mean that you are subservient to the Minister of Finance. Clearly, we do not belong to any ministry in the country. It's an autonomous institution with operational independence. Thank you very much, Doc. We will take our first commercial break. Um, my guest, Dr. Max Opokafari, first Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana, taking us through his personal life at the beginning, then into the meat of the economy and the Bank of Ghana. When we come back from the break, I want to talk about accountability and other matters in the Bank of Ghana. This is Spotlight Business. My name is Philip Nanfuri. We'll be right back. I'm tired of you trying to get rid of me every chance that you get. My gun is in the trash. I've worked very hard to get you, Francis, and you know that. Because I don't deserve you. I didn't think you could handle it. Telling me it's not your fault. I pray I'll never need your services. A perfect world where love doesn't blind all children. I'm getting married this weekend. Right. Thanks for your company and welcome back from our break. This is Spotlight on MX24. My name is Philip Nanfuri. My guest, the astute and esteemed Dr. Max Opokafari, first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana. We've been discussing the Bank of Ghana and the issue of independence. And he's told us that it's far-fetched to see a minister of finance, and not a specific minister of finance, pick a phone and call and ask for them to print money. So viewers, listeners, dissuade yourselves of that notion. Some of us think that these guys at the top uh, and I need somebody else at a higher place. He just told us that that's not what's going on. We're going to find out from them how the accountability process and transparency in Bank of Ghana is going. Over the course of three years, we've had a lot of discussions that brought some issues uh, to the light. And I'm sure you bear me witness that as an institution, there were some failings which measures have been taken to be corrected. One thing the Bank of Ghana did was to institute the Office of Ethics and Internal Investigations to ensure that people in-house are brought to book if there's a problem. Amongst other things, you've taken a number of measures, and I think the public must commend you. I, especially for somebody who has learned accounts, getting data from BOG website is as simple as anything else. However, there are still other things that people might think of. In terms of transparency and, and accountability, I know your law 
stipulates that you must report to Parliament every six months on your activities and stuff like that. Do you think that's enough? And in your dealings with the public, how you communicate with the public, your press releases, etc., everything around accountability and transparency, how do you think you guys have performed? No, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, it's, in, it's, it's quite interesting talking about accountability and transparency because Bank of Ghana implements the inflation targeting framework. And one of the key pillars or principles of an inflation targeting central bank is accountability and transparency. You start from primacy of price stability, you talk about uh, uh, inflation objectives or targets, you talk about accountability, you talk about communication. So these are the issues that put together gives you the entire framework that underpins an inflation targeting central bank. You recall that when we started the financial sector cleanup, at any point in time, we issued a comprehensive assessment of processes that we went through to be able to arrive at the decision and to arrive at the decision to revoke the licenses of the banks that yeah. we did. And in, those, in that uh, press communication, we were very clear in terms of where the sources of this crisis came from, including having poor corporate management uh, uh, practices, poor risk management framework, including having some fraudulent activities in some of these financial institutions. And then we did not shy away of talking about the fact that supervisory failures also contributed to that. So that has clearly been spelled out. And every time that we've gone out to issue a statement, we had spelled out clearly what these issues are. Out of that is when we set up what led to the setting up of the Office of Ethics and Internal Investigation. Prior to setting up the Office of Tech Ethics and Internal Investigation, Bank of Ghana itself internally had what we call, still has what we call the disciplinary committee. But we thought that from what has happened, it's important to have a special unit called Ethics and Internal because of some of the conflict of interest issues and some of the other issues that came up. And that uh, committee has been operating and has redefined the code of ethics of the central bank, has redefined a lot of other issues including conflict of interest and the processes and including a whistleblowing process and has also investigated some of the activities of the staff and different staff have received different kinds of uh, 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 punishment. punishment in one way or the yeah, other, yeah. depending on the degree of involvement in that. So that has, has happened in the Bank of Ghana, and we've not shied away from that. But that the onus of this crisis is really not on the central bank, but it's, it, we spot it as on the... On the, uh, on, on, the, on the market players, on the shareholders of this institution, on the management of this institution, the poor corporate governance practices, boards dominated by shareholders, boards acting as if they are part of the management and taking credit decisions. These are some of the things that we've had, and fraudulent practices. And so we should try to put the blame where it is. And we are working together to ensure that, that some of the corrective measures that have been introduced are embedded and become part of the supervisory framework that has been strengthened to ensure that this does not happen again. In addition to that, exactly today is one year when we introduced the Ghana Deposit Protection Corporation yeah. to ensure that in the unlikely event that there should be any institution that will have a problem. There is a well-laid-out process of trying to address that and so that we will not return to something like what we saw in the last two, three years. Then moving on to talking about uh, data, I'm very happy that you said yes. that. And the director of research will be happy to hear that, <laughs> that it's easy to get data from the center. But we continue to work to make sure that data is available. It's part of the transparency process. It's part of shaping the expectation of the market agents to make sure that they can have integrity in the data that we put out there. And it helps them to also build credibility for the policies of the central bank. And if there is any currency any central bank has at all, the biggest currency any central bank has is its credibility. Okay. And data is one of the most important piece. uh, uh, pieces that promotes credibility. Okay. Um, I was going through your strategic plan, 2018 20, 2022. And I think personally, I like the acronym you used, STAR, Strategic Execution, 
with, with teamwork achieves results. In there, I saw that um, you mentioned the issue of accountability and ethics being central to the central bank's mm -hmm. operations. If, if you can just give us a snapshot, the Bank of Ghana of the future, where Bank of Ghana will be heading, what will be in place. And one thing that I would, I would like to ask, in the course of the banking sector discussions, there were issues about the BSD. Should BSD be carved out to sit on its own, together with the other financial institutions' supervision? Should it be on it? Stuff like that. Should we, what should we expect in the coming years from Bank of Ghana, based on your strategic plan? No, I'm quite happy that you've actually taken a look at that star <laughs> document, which is the strategic plan. Yes, you can see from that document that we're looking at a central bank that is an institution of excellence. And the core value systems that we are introducing in, in that strategic document is building on uh, transparency and ethics, trying to address conflict of issue, uh, interest issues, trying to ensure that we build a working culture, a culture that strives towards excellence. And that's what the strategy document is looking at. And it also spells out clearly the clear pillars of uh, uh, objectives of the central bank. We have the tier one objectives, which is the objective that is owned by the board and management. And this is cascaded down to tier two objectives, which is owned by departments which is ahead by heads of departments, okay. so they take the accountability for that. And then we cascade down, down further to tier three objectives, which is the objective that every single staff in the bank also owns it to make sure that my contribution feeds into the, uh, the objectives of the department and the department contribution feeds into the tier one objectives of the bank, which is the overall objective of the central bank. So that has been put down and is for a five-year uh, document from 2019, 2018 to 2022. So it's a five-year document. That is what is shaping our strategy going forward. But the central bank of the future, we're talking about a lot of other things that are coming on. I think you may have heard the governor announcing that the Bank of Ghana is looking at piloting yes. uh, 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 an e-currency. And that e-currency is different from mobile money. So I want to make that very clear. Okay. The e-currency is part of our paper currency that we want to issue it in the form of an electronic money, which will then facilitate the e-payment systems and also facilitate the mobile money uh, ecosystem and uh, allow fintechs and other players in the system to be able to create value out of that e-currency. And that pilot is in train and we are working towards that. You also talked about should we be able to carve out the supervision department following the, uh, the financial sector cleanup? I want us to draw our minds back to 2008, 2009, during the global financial crisis, yeah. where we saw that a few other jurisdictions did exactly the same. And let me single out the UK, where they, they actually carved out the supervision department and formed the Financial Services Authority. Authority. But what do we see now? The Financial Services Authority has been disbanded, and now we have what you call the PRA, Prudential Regulatory Authority, and the Financial Conduct Authority. Okay. And the PRA has been brought back into the Bank of England okay. as an autonomous unit within, within the Bank the of England, that. headed by a deputy governor. Okay. That alone should give you a sense that you cannot divorce financial stability from price stability and monetary policy objective. Because okay. you need these uh, synergies from the two. You cannot have a comprehensive assessment of monetary policy without looking at the financial stability concerns. And that was a major failure we had during the global financial crisis. So clearly, we have to look at what works for us. And in our jurisdiction, I think that this framework is working for Ghana and is delivering the financial stability and macroeconomic stability that we have. And I think that we we'll continue to work on that as we continue to see how these things evolve. So uh, with your permission, let me just ask a follow-up. Some were talking about uh, the Twin Peaks regulatory approach, like what you just mentioned. So it, uh, from what I'm gathering, we should still go ahead with our silo system where BOG is there, SIS, NIC is there, I beg your pardon, NPR, SEC, or do you think in the not so far future we'll have what South Africa uses, this Twin Peaks where you have a prudential authority and a financial conduct authority? Do you think we'll be getting there or for now yes. we are good where we are? No, I can see where you are coming from because from lessons from this uh, financial sector cleanup, 
we realize that there have been some regulatory arbitrage yeah. because of the silo operation. But that's why the president put together the Financial that's Stability yeah. Council. Yeah. And the Financial Stability Council has created a forum where all these regulatory bo uh, bodies come together, chaired by the governor of the central bank, with the MPRA head there, with the SEC head there, with the uh, NIC, NIC head there. So this creates a forum where we can have the interconnectedness discussion to see the risks that are coming from each side and also to try to block the regulatory arbitrage that we saw prior to the financial sector cleanup. And so that cures the need to have this twin pick approach because we have created, Set. and Ghana is one of the few countries, if not the second or the third country in South Saharan Africa that has a financial stability council set up and is functioning. Okay. And to our viewers and listeners, if you go to the Bank of Ghana's website, you see that they've published the financial stability Report. review yeah. there. Uh, I think 29th September was the date it was released. So it chronicles all the four institutions, pensions, capital and money markets, the banking and non-bank side, and then the insurance. So if you can go there, it's about 30 pages. You can just quickly go through and see how all these four work in synergy. And as Doc has just rightly said, they are trying to cure the arbitrage that existed before the cleanup started. Um, I want us to move into another part of our discussion. And it has to do with the almighty Ghana City and how every time, and I must say media houses are also part of the, of the, of the noise. You turn onto your radio, the city has depreciated by this, this has done that. We are approaching an election year. You have uh, more or less spoken about how consolidation has moved and we may not experience a, such a bad slippage in the coming months. But there are developments in the U U.S. Uh, we just saw the first debate, which some described as chaos. We saw that the markets moved to it, either positively or negatively. We've seen UK, US, I beg your pardon, UK, EU relations. With the Ghana city, where do you think we are going? What, a, what will be the trajectory in the coming months? Um, should we see significant depreciation? Should we see appreciation, stability? What are your views and what are the projections on that? If I give projections, we are in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, but let, let, let me take it from where we've come from. I think if you look at previous years, we actually entered 2020 with a very solid foundation in terms of uh, gross international reserves accumulation. Mm -hmm. We ended 2019 with about 8.4 billion US dollars in terms of gross reserve, which was about 4.2 months of import cover. And that is the highest we've ever had. So we came wow. in at that point, which shows that we have enough cushion to be able to withstand any uh, uh, such uh, uh, external vulnerabilities. But before I continue, if you look at previous years, most of the time the currency moves a lot in the first five months of the year. But this time we entered the year with this solid uh, level of gross international reserves. Then there have also been other reforms that have been introduced by the central bank, which we did not see in the past. One of such reforms is the introduction of the forward auction market, mm -hmm. which was introduced in the last two months of 2019, but it gained full operational impact in the first quarter of 2020. And what that does is that people are able to now buy FX ahead. So if you need foreign exchange in a month's time, you can buy FX today, and get it in 30 days time. What that has done is that it has removed or eased the pressure on the spot market, which means that the pressure that is on the spot market that determines the spot rate, which we call the exchange rate, has been eased somehow because people have bought ahead and yeah. they've been guaranteed that come seven days time, I'll what have my FS. Come 30 days time, I'll have my FS. Come 50, and some even by 70 days ahead. So that pressure that has been moved off the spot market also came into play at the beginning of the year. Then on top of that, through proper timing and some wind of chance, we happened to go to the euro bond market yeah. just before For the hits. Pande yeah. pandemic hit and got in 3 billion US dollars to also come to add to the 
gross international reserves that have been built up. In addition to that, when the um, pandemic hit, Ghana assessed one billion US dollars from the IMF as part of the rapid credit facility to address the COVID. So when you put all this together, it positioned the central bank to be able to have enough reserves to be able to support the currency going okay. forward. And what did we see? In the first three, four months of the year, we actually saw an appreciation of the currency. Whereas in other similar months in the comparable years back, we saw significant depreciation in the currency. And then going forward, we've seen that the currency has gradually remained virtually stable. You see, there is a difference between stability and and fix. Ghana is not a fixed fix exchange rate system. Yeah. But a reasonable movement within an acceptable band is what we call currency stability. Okay. And we've seen the currency being stable. And as at last week, last Friday, the uh, cumulative depreciation of the CD to the dollar was 2.9%. I think that's fair enough. That's what we've had the best uh, in terms of currency development since 2006, 2.9%. So what do we see? Now that we've crossed the first half and even crossed the first nine months, we, we're now going to have the cocoa inflows coming in okay. to also shore uh, up uh, our foreign reserves. So with the external vulnerabilities that you talked about from the U.S. and from Brexit and from other, what do we have to say? Do we have enough reserves to be able to address those challenges that come in? One other important development that I want to highlight is the fact that we Ghana faced significant external vulnerabilities from non-resident participants in our domestic market. Okay. At, the big, at the end of 2017, non-residents accounted for about 34.8% of total domestic debt. Yes. Over time, we've been able to many reduce that vulnerability. But the reason why it's a vulnerability is that when they decide to move out, it then is. it impacts the yeah. currency. Yeah. Over time, we've been able to remove that vulnerability. As we speak now, non-residents account for 19.8% of total domestic debt. So we've dropped it from 34.8% to 19.8%. So that is a significant reduction in that external vulnerability that should anything happen externally and they decide to move, do we have enough resources to accommodate that? How were we able to achieve this significant reduction? Because domestic debt has not dropped. Yeah. If the external investors has exited, then who took it up? Right? The gap. Who closed the gap? So the local investors. It's local investors. And the banks. And where did the banks get the resources to take this up? Within. Because of the reforms that we introduced. Okay. The reforms that we introduced to clean up the banking sector has well positioned them. They've become well capitalized. We increase the minimum capital requirements to 400. So you see, we're beginning to see the gains and the benefits yeah. from the reforms that we introduce. And that's what has helped us to minimize the vulnerabilities and that we can say that we'll be able to have some stability throughout the uh, end of the year, which is different from what we've seen in other years, especially in election years. Okay. Dr. Max Afari, First Deputy Governor, Bank of Ghana. My name is Philip Nanfu. We're taking our last commercial break. We'll be right back. No, this is not business as usual. This is a different kind of business. From the global stock market, to our central bank, to insights on insurance and investment, Spotlight is a show for you. Here, we look beyond the numbers. On Spotlight, we'll tell you the complexity behind the figures. On Spotlight, we examine hardcore financial issues. Join me, Philip Nanfuri, on MX24, together with policymakers and experts as we talk business. Hi there, my name is Alaya Mande and I'm the host of Off The Cuff here on MX24. I'm excited to come your way with football conversations, sports related conversations, light hearted, lifestyle related conversations about the sport that we all love and are passionate about. Make a date with me.
Right, thanks for your company. This is Spotlight Business. My name is Philip Nanfuri. My guest throughout the odd 45 plus to 50 minutes has been the first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Maxwell Pokwafari. We've been discussing his taste and preferences. Uh, he's, a, he's a man of God, a man of the gospel. Maybe one day we may see him owning a church or so. You can never tell. We've discussed the Bank of Ghana also. We looked at issues of transparency, accountability, independence. Uh, we've heard very strong arguments from him with regards to the position of the Central Bank on certain matters. We've also looked at um, the currency, which we just discussed before we went on the break. And we're in our last leg of the discussion, uh, the last lap. And I want us to look at the payment system structure, as he's the head of the payment system department within the Bank of Ghana. Over the course of um, 2017 to date, there have been significant interventions in our payment systems infrastructure and then the need to go uh, digital or electronic. We've seen the introduction of the universal QR code, we've seen proxy pay, we've seen Momo interoperability, and a whole range of things. Now we want to find out from him, what else do we have in store with regards to the payment systems infrastructure? Some of you have been asking about cryptocurrencies and when we we'll see it in Ghana and Ethereum and all other things. What does the Bank of Ghana have to tell us with regards to its uh, oversight when it comes to the payment system infrastructure? I think we've done some significant amount of work in getting ourselves on the right path. Uh, I know a number of people are still adopting. People still have fears of it, even though they are educated, knowledgeable, but they still have fears. Broadly, with the payment infrastructure, Doc, Give us your views on it and where we are heading with regards to our cash light or cashless agenda. Thank you very much, Philip. I think I'll try to trace back from 2007 when Ghana decided to allow for mobile money in Ghana. And it was so common in, in Kenya. It has caught up in Kenya and there was a push to have that in Ghana. Fortunately, I was in the Bank of Ghana then, played a key role okay. with under the leadership of Governor Aqua yeah. and also current Vice President, uh, His Excellency Alaji Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, to introduce the branchless banking guidelines. And when we decided to go into the branchless banking guidelines, we decided to go bank-based approach. For us in Kenya, they did not go bank-based, meaning if you want to participate in the mobile money sphere, you must come through a bank. So if you go to Kenya, Safaricom is a telco that operates mobile money. But if you come to Ghana, MTN does not operate mobile money. We have what you call MTN Financial Services, which has to register a financial service that is supervised by the Bank of Ghana mm -hmm. that operates mobile money. In fact, technically, there is no relationship between the central bank. We do not supervise MTN as an institution, but we supervise MTN financial services, okay. and we do the same for Vodacash and Airtel Tigo. They all have to set up financial services institutions that operate as their own separate entity, the mobile money system. That has served Ghana very well. And then we also decided that we needed a common switch platform. For, to support the payment system architecture in Ghana. That was very visionary in 2007, and we introduced what we call the Ghana Interbank Payments and Settlement System, GIPS, GIPS yeah. where we moved all our RTGS, check uh, CCC, check uh, ACH, check uh, code truncation, and all of the payment system to GIPS to have a centralized place, to have a common platform because prior to that, we had different banks having their own switches, and they were not communicating to each other. By putting all of them together, it liberalized and opened up the payment uh, system architecture for that. And then from there, we built on that gradually until the new Payment Systems and Services Act was passed, which was an amendment or a complete uh, uh, repeal of the old Payment Systems Act. Okay. The difference is there was a Payment Systems Act. Now we have Payment Systems and Services Act. Okay. And so the Payment Systems and Services Act now creates room for the central bank to bring in the fintechs and directly license them and supervise them. Okay. We are doing that in a carefully balanced way to ensure that they are not constrained to be innovative. So there is a way to 
have supervision, but at the same time, flexibility to be innovative and striking a good balance to promoting financial inclusion and financial stability. So that's what the new Payment Systems and Services Act has introduced. And on that, we've been able to introduce what we call interoperability. And all that means is that prior to that, those who belong to MTN, MTN. could not transfer across to Airtel to go to Vodacash. We've been able to achieve that, but we did not end there. We've now been able to move that to be able to move it from there to your bank account. Okay. And then we did not add there, we were able to be able to move that to move it to the e-switch card account, which is the biometric card that was introduced in 2007, 2008. So we have this triangular interoperability, which makes Ghana the only country in Sub-Saharan Africa that has achieved full interoperability. When you hear interoperability in other countries, they are really talking about between two telcos. But we've gone beyond the telcos and brought in the banking That's sector to problem. try to uh, unify this process. And it is on this interoperability process that the vice president then launched the universal QR code. And that agenda to launch the universal QR code is to push the cash light agenda. Because okay. there are three key objectives for the financial sector, uh, financial development and inclusion uh, 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 project, which is looking at uh, uh, a cash light agenda, uh, uh, having a cash light agenda, having an e-government program, okay. and promoting financial inclusion. And this is what this is achieving through the payment okay. system. Okay, look, unfortunately we have just a minute, okay. uh, but I think you have been able to articulate the key points. The last question I'm going to ask you is not related to financial services, macroeconomy. It's a question from one of my very esteemed viewers. And he's asking me if your performance tonight has any link with you being a pojoba. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's it, bro. <laughs> unfortunately, That's where I built my foundation. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I know people will be talking about me, but some of us, we didn't go to the hardcore uh, uh, secondary schools. I will not mention my secondary school on air for anybody to know. If you like, you can go and find it on my social media, but yeah. I will not mention <laughs> Anyway, Doc, 30 seconds, one key point you want us to take away from this discussion. One key point in everything we've discussed or anything else that you want viewers and listeners to take away from the discussion. Just in 30 seconds, do that for me, please. No, I think that uh, comprehensively there has been a lot, of, a lot of reforms that have been introduced in the monetary policy framework in the financial sector framework, in the payment system framework, and we've tried to embed these reforms to institutionalize them to ensure that it provides a solid anchor for conducting policy going forward, which means that we have a strong foundation for a medium to long-term policy framework that is sustainable and that will lift Ghana into an emerging market economy with the government's transformation agenda as a driver. Dr. Max Opokafari, first Deputy Governor, the Bank of Ghana. We've been discussing a lot on tonight's edition of Spotlight. My name, Philip Nanfu. This has been MX24. I thank the team for the brilliant production they've put in place. I wish you all a very good night. This and every Sunday at 3 p.m.